Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. In our gospel lesson for today, Jesus gives his disciples a difficult teaching when he says, A little while and you will see me no longer. And again, a little while and you will see me. They are concerned about the fact that Jesus is going to leave them for a time. And then at some other time, he is going to return. And I can't imagine the disciples were really excited to have Jesus follow up with these words. You will weep and lament, but the world will rejoice. You will be sorrowful, but your sorrow will turn to joy. Sure, Jesus ends on a note of joy. What about all that hatred of the world? And who wants to have to endure sorrow? The disciples seem to have a good reason to be concerned. For our part, the anxiety of Jesus' followers may seem like a little bit of an overreaction. We look back on the incident and know what lies ahead for them. Jesus will leave on the, third, on, on the day when he is handed over to the Gentiles and is set to be crucified. And we know that on the third day, our Savior will rise again. And whatever terrors the disciples had experienced, well, those will be turned into joy. The only thing is, the disciples don't know all this. Or at the very least, they don't understand it. For them, the future is uncertain and confusing. Just think about what it must have been like for the disciples to hear that Jesus was actually going to leave them and that they would suffer and that at some undisclosed point in the future, everything would be okay and they would have joy. The disciples know that Jesus is not exactly liked by everyone. His teachings to some were very controversial and on occasion it aroused so much ire that those who opposed Jesus actually wanted to kill him. Following the Christ has come at a great cost for the disciples. It meant that some of them have had to leave family and friends behind. Sometimes they would need to suffer without food or go on for days seemingly without sleep. The disciples of Jesus have actually given up a great deal. And they have come so far with Jesus that now it almost seems like they actually depend on him. For Jesus to leave now, in their minds, it, it probably makes them feel like they are being abandoned. They will remain behind in a world that is hostile to them because they are the followers of Jesus. How is it now that their teacher, whom they have come to revere, can actually leave them in such circumstances? How could he say so matter-of-factly that he wasn't going to be around, that they would be persecuted, and yet everything would be okay. When we think about life from their perspective, maybe it's not too hard to realize why they are so concerned about Jesus leaving. The strange thing is, as much as this text speaks directly to the disciples, so much so does it also speak to us. While Jesus has promised to be with his church always, it doesn't always feel like Jesus is with his church. In fact, sometimes it probably feels more like the time between Good Friday and Easter Sunday. We cannot see Jesus. He is not in flesh walking around among us any longer. It almost seems as if he's not here. Or at least, that's what the devil wants it to seem like. Living as a Christian in the 21st century can kind of be a lonely experience, too. We, like the disciples, are not loved by the world around us. As the followers of Jesus, we are known as those who hold teachings that are blasphemous to our culture. We are shunned publicly and privately. And if you haven't experienced those things yet, it probably won't be that long until you do. We are looked at as fools who are hostile to the progress of our country and everything from politics to technology. And while that couldn't be further from the truth, it is not easy to be looked at and to be treated that way. 
There is a lot of pressure for us to conform to our society. And it was no different for the disciples. They were even constantly beset by those who did not like Jesus. And some of them even accused the disciples themselves of actually breaking the word of God instead of actually keeping it. You can think of the Pharisees. That's what they said to the disciples. Why do your disciples, Jesus, do these things that are contrary to the traditions of men? And they thought that those things were the word of God. Well, it's not going to be any different for us. If we live according to the teaching of Christ, we too are going to be persecuted and called foolish by the world. Sometimes the world is so foolish... It will even say that we are breaking the word of God because it doesn't know the word of God any more than the Pharisees. And when we don't go along with the world because we follow Christ, the world is not going to take kindly to our faithfulness. In such times and circumstance, a kind of desire which is driven by fear can set in. It is a desire not so much to be loved by the world, just not to be persecuted by it. And in these times, we can long for the truth of Christ to be immediately and undeniably manifest to the world, like it will be at the second coming. We want this so that what we believe, teach, and confess, which is the truth, we want it so that may be vindicated for all to see, and we thereby spare the burden of the world's hostility. As the days drag on, however, between the first coming of our Lord and his return, and the sufferings of the people of God increase, we may begin to wonder where Jesus is and why he has not returned. In those moments, we probably feel something like the disciples did when Jesus was buried in the tomb on the second day. And just as it was confusing and at times seemingly uncertain for them, so can it be in our lives. We, like the disciples, have heard the word of Jesus that has been honest enough to tell us that we're going to suffer and that sometimes it's going to feel like Jesus isn't there. But like the disciples, we are not to be afraid. And we do not have to wonder if Jesus is here or wonder if everything is going to be okay. That's why Jesus goes on in our reading today and he says to them, I will see you again. and Your hearts will rejoice. No one will take your joy from you. Bad days are coming, but they are not days without joy because Jesus has ultimately triumphed. It is in this triumph that we are to find our joy in the midst of all sadness. There is no suffering too great, no sorrow too broad where the joy of Christ cannot reach. It may not always feel that way, but that is the truth. Because the joy that Jesus brings is the joy that transcends everything. And what is this joy but the fact that Jesus has fulfilled his promise to rise three days later from, <clears throat> from the tomb? To the world, that event doesn't actually seem that significant. I mean, we would think that it would, but to them, it doesn't. They either pass it off as some ancient fable or pretend that it's just not important to the modern world in which we live. But it couldn't be more wrong on either account. Because Jesus did, in fact, rise from the dead. He showed himself in glorious form with his resurrected body, still bearing the mark of the nails and the wound in his side. The risen Christ is the promise of ultimate victory, not simply because he has triumphed, but because his triumph is given to us. The world is slowly drawing closer to a life that ends with sin and death. It doesn't matter who you are, or where you live, or what time you come from. That truth is inescapable for everyone. But for us, with all the evil in us and all the evil we experience in the world, those things will not be our end. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life 
And this gift of eternal life has been assured for us in the resurrection of the Lord of life. Think about this for a moment. What evil can we endure in the world that can keep the resurrection from us? Can the hostility of the world at the teaching of Jesus undo the resurrection? The mocking that we face for the confession of the truth, can it take away the forgiveness of sins? Can death itself overcome the gift of life that is given to all those who trust in Jesus? There is nothing in the world, not one thing, not even the power of the devil itself, that can overcome the love of God in the sacrifice of his son and the vindication of his resurrection. That does not mean we will not suffer. It does not mean that we will not have sorrow. Jesus says both of those things are going to occur, just like they did for the disciples. But no matter of suffering or sorrow can overcome the forgiveness we have received and the resurrection that is going to be ours on the last day. So whatever troubles us, whatever fears we may have, whatever loneliness there is in our lives, they are nothing in comparison to Christ's triumph in the resurrection of his flesh, which is a sign of the things to come. Our lives will not be easy, but they will always be joyful. Not joyful in the sense that we are always going to feel happy, content, or carefree but joyful in the sense that our lives are not lived in vain because our Lord's life was not lived in vain. We are actually a people destined for great things here in time and forever in eternity. We are destined for a life shaped and formed by the crucifying of our evil flesh by means of sorrow and suffering and the raising of it to the newness of life and the forgiveness of sins and the sure and certain hope of the resurrection unto eternal life. So like Jesus once told his disciples that he would see them again, so does he say the same thing to us. And just as their hearts were comforted with this truth, which no one could take from them, so are ours. Because he lives, we also shall live. And not even the devil himself or the world can undo that promise. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Now may the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, guide your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Amen.